Hello and welcome to this bare metal programming series where we're building and exploring firmware for a Cortex M4 SDM32 microcontroller. Now this is episode one in the series and there has been an episode zero which is just introducing the projects, the goals, the non-goals and the hardware that we're using. If you kind of want to get an overview of where we're going you can check that one out. You'll find a link in the description. Today we're actually going to be building the first firmware code for the the board that we're using here and in order to do that we first have to actually kind of set up the environment and install the lib uh, lib open cm3 library so let's uh switch over to the code view here and just take a look at the repository as it stands now so this is an basically an uninitialized repository which just contains a few files here one of them is just the little presentation that i've showed uh, the other is just where we're going to download this lib OpenCM3 library from. And we have an app directory here, which contains uh, just an empty C program, which is going to constitute our firmware. It contains basically a very small uh, header file just in order to actually have uh, two directories. We have a linker script. This linker script is taken almost verbatim from the lib OpenCM3 project for this chip and uh, we're going to get really deep into the linker script at some moment talking about how kind of how it works what its purpose is and it's going to become really important when we deal with the bootloader um, but for now we can more or less ignore this and just know that it is a file required for the compilation process which kind of tells uh, you know kind of tells the compiler like where the essential stuff of this chip is like where is RAM? Where is ROM? Because if you want to generate code and you, you want to make jumps from this, this line to this line, you kind of want, need to know like where you start. So that's kind of what the linker script does. Um, we also have a make file here. Again, this is taken almost verbatim from the lib OpenCM3 examples. Um, I've actually condensed this down uh, and collected up the various bits of makefile that they have in that repository just to focus on this one processor and just to kind of keep everything as simple as possible. So the makefile, you can think of it as a very simple description of all of the files that we have, uh, where our libraries and everything are located, um, what kind of chip we're compiling for. So we have to uh, define some special options for that. Um, we have to describe our linker script, um, uh, describe the different tools that get run here. And basically the rest is just, you know, telling, telling it how to compile these files, right? So we're not going to go into this for now. And probably the only thing we'll really touch in this is uh, where we, when we add new source files, we'll come and place them in here. But aside from that, we don't really need to know the details of the make file. We may look more in detail at the compilation process at some point and kind of the flags that get passed to GCC in order to make it generate the right code for this chip. But we're not going to do too much of that for now. The last kind of important thing um, to know is I've got this VS Code directory up here. This is kind of the Visual Co Studio Code settings for this project. And it just contains a couple of things. So it contains... Um, some C++, uh, C and C++ extension properties that uh, just say like, you know, this is what kind of compiler we're using and this is kind of how you should generate the IntelliSense. Um, we also say like what is involved in our include path so, so we can actually find definitions for functions and things like that and kind of like any defines that should be given to the preprocessor and be assumed and this basically means that, uh, you know, sometimes you pass a, a definition at a compile time and that will either include a piece of code or it will not. And you kind of want to tell your editor, like, no, this piece of code will be included. So kind of kind of know that. So that's what these two defines do. They just basically um, tell the editor to recognize that, like, certain bits of code will be included. So you can just use this in your project. It's fine. Uh, the other part is that I have this tasks file and this tasks file um, exposes a couple of like commands just to build uh, like the bootloader. We don't have a bootloader yet, but this will be the command that does. This part will build our main application and you can see it just calls make bin. 
And uh, there are a couple more little scripts up here which just call into the JLink tools, which allow us to run some JLink scripts to, and in this case, all it does is uh, tell the JLink to power the board or to unpower the board. So you don't always have to do that with JLink. This is just the way I have my JLink set up. And if you have an ST link, you won't have to have any kind of power on power down because as soon as you plug in the USB cable, the board will have power. Um, finally, there is a launch uh, JSON. This is what allows us to configure the debugger in uh, Visual Studio Code. And again, it just calls into the JLink tools, right? So um, there are ST tools for this as well. So if you're using the ST link, you can use the ST link tools in order to generate, uh, um, you know, set up your debugger. But in this case, we have one configuration that allows us to build the firmware, flash it to the device, and then debug. And we have one uh, configuration that allows us to connect to a running system. So we don't build and flash. We simply connect to a system that already is running and has firmware. And as long as that firmware matches the code that we have, we should be able to pause the program and use the debugger as normal. So these are two very useful configurations to have while you're debugging. All right, um, that's kind of it. And if not all of that made sense, then don't worry, right? I'm, I'm going to try and approach this gently. And although I'm not going to be like explicitly teaching C in this, in this uh, series, I do um, understand that some people are not going to be that familiar with C. So I'm going to try and also explain some of the idiosync idiosyncrasies in that respect and kind of what I'm doing and, you know, some, some of the basic elements. Okay, uh, I'll just take a little sip of water here because I'll be talking for a while. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do here is to set up kind of an infinite loop um, in the main function. And again, if you're not really from like kind of what, what if you're not familiar with working with microcontrollers or the embedded world or like really, really low level programming, you might be more used to writing programs that don't have any infinite loops in them, right? Normally you don't want to put an infinite loop in your program because that would be bad, right? You want your programs to end. You, you, they start, they do something interesting, and then they return the result and finish. That's a little bit different from microcontrollers, right? Because you're running a program and it's the only program on the system. So like, it cannot end. Like it doesn't make even make sense for a program to end on a microcontroller because what would the CPU run afterwards? The CPU is on. There's no kind of turning the CPU off once it's on. And that CPU just wants to run instructions all the time. So the way that we do that is we just structure code as a big loop. And actually under the hood, a lot of low level code, you know, on your operating system in event loops and all kinds of things is actually just a big loop where you're checking things. Um, again and again and again, and kind of seeing how state has changed since the last time that the loop span around. So that's kind of uh, what we're going to need, right? And because of that, we're never actually going to return from here. Like, we will never return. We just have to put the return zero here because that's the signature of this function. Okay, so now we have that. The goal of this first initial hello world firmware is just going to be to blink an onboard LED. So what is involved in that is we're going to have to tell the processor to tell the GPIO, the general purpose input output peripheral, to actually turn a pin on and off. And this is going to be the specific pin which is connected to the LED on this board. Um, I happen to know where that is, so I'm just going to explicitly write it out. But you can find that out by looking at the schematics of your uh, development board. Or if you happen to have put your own LED in, which you absolutely can, of course, you just have to make sure that you configure the pin, which is, you know, connected to this LED. So we're going to have to actually configure the general purpose input output peripheral to actually set up our pin. So it's going to be an output and we can write to it. And we're going to have to uh, do a little bit of configuration as well to the overall system clock to get that up and running. So I think I'm going to start out with the system clock because it's the most kind of lowest level, most important thing to do when you bring the system up is to get the clock kind of configuration set up. For that, we need the RCC, which is the you know, the kind of clock configuration. Uh, I don't know if you would even call it a peripheral, but it's kind of the clock configuration of the, the STM32. 
So we're going to include uh, our first thing from lib. And actually, this is not going to work because we don't even have lib OpenCM3 installed yet. So let's, before we get into that, let's actually install the git submodule for this. Um, now, if you clone this repository, the submodule will already be kind of registered, so you won't need to add it, but you will need to run git submodule in it and git submodule update just to pull the code in. Uh, when you have that, we can go inside the lib opencm3 directory itself, which is now going to be full of uh, the, you know, the core library files, and we're going to just going to run make. And make is just going to build all of the, the, the library files and objects so that we have those available when we actually compile, right? We don't have to compile the lib opencm3 library every time we uh, build our own code. We just do that the one time now. So that's what's happening down here. It's building away. It takes about a minute or so. Um, and once we have that, we can actually go and include the RCC uh, header file. So I already know that that's going to end up being at lib opencm3 stm32 rcc because I happen to have this installed elsewhere and I know kind of how that is going to lay out. So we are going to write a function which is going to be our rcc setup. So it's going to be a void function because it doesn't return anything and we'll just call it rcc setup doesn't take any arguments, so we'll write void there too. And we will make the whole function static, uh, which just means that it belongs to this file, right? It's not a global function. We're not exposing this function. We mark it as static to say, like, this is available only within this translation unit. And a translation unit, you can think of it as just being sort of the C file plus all the header files that it includes. <coughs> Okay, so what we actually want to do here is we want to kind of set the CPU clock and frequency and the, the hardware that actually kind of sets up that clock frequency. So to do that, we call this function RCC and we have this function available because we included it from this header. Um, so it's the RCC clock setup PLL. PLL stands for phased locked loop. Um, and it's actually, a, well, a phased lock loop is a dedicated piece of hardware that's built around a feedback loop, and it allows you to take one uh, clock frequency signal in and produce a different clock frequency signal out, or maybe even a phase shifted signal as well, or maybe even multiple clock frequencies, often multiple clock frequencies. Um, I'm not going to get into the details. I don't think I could even explain them if I wanted to, but you can always check out the, the signal path channel and see uh, uh, he's explained a lot of different PLLs over there. So if you want to get a good idea about how they work, you can check that out here. It's a little bit out of scope for now. So to this function, <clears throat> which is going to set up clock up, we need to pass a const struct RCC clock scale pointer uh, to this thing. And if you're not like already a C programmer, I think this is just about one of the like most off-putting types that you can imagine having to take in a function. It's, like, it's kind of just like the first thing you have to do, but it's not as complex as it seems and you can break it down. So um, this struct RCC clock scale, that is just a a type of an object. It's an object type, right? So there's an object out there called RCC clock scale, and it happens to have a certain set of properties and members and pieces of data. And that's just like a fixed thing. So that's what the struct, um, the struct RCC clock scale is. It's a fit. It's just an object type. Const means we're passing it in and we don't expect this function to change it. So um, it's just a marker to indicate that this function will not modify the thing that we pass in. And we're actually passing in a pointer. So it's, it's an assurance that we will continue sort of the ownership of this object. We, we don't expect this function to kind of do anything to this object and we're still in control of it. So that's kind of what all of that means. Now, thankfully, um, there is actually a kind of preset 
uh, there are a few preset kind of clock configurations for this chip out there uh, included within lib OpenCM3. So we don't have to configure this from scratch, although we could, and we will look at what it looks like. So if we just um, start typing in, and this is kind of how I work with this library is I use the IntelliSense heavily. I type in the, the name of the thing I'm working with. So all of the this library's functions, uh, kind of like constants, all of the enums, all of those kind of things, they all just begin with the thing that they refer to. So RCC underscore. So if you just do that, you're going to get like access to all of the things which are relevant for the RCC. There happen to be quite a lot of them. Um, but I happen to know that we need the RCC HSI uh, configs. So there are a set of configs. And you can see that this actually matches exactly almost the signature that we looked at, the construct RCC scale uh, configs. This happens to be an array of four of them. And we need a specific one. So we need the RCC, um, I don't remember exactly what goes in this part. So it's the clock 3.384 megahertz configuration. <clears throat> and you can see that there's a reg squiggly line here because this isn't actually quite what the function needs, the function needs a pointer to one of these things, and we've just given it one of these things, right? A const struct. So we need to uh, just basically give the address of this thing so that the function can deal with that. And the reason is that you do something like this is because if you were to pass the whole object, you're actually passing a copy of the whole object, right? You're, you're sort of pushing it uh, somewhere else and kind of copying it around. And we don't need to do that. We can just say, hey, use this one over here. That's why it's a pointer. Okay, so what is this thing actually? Let's actually uh, just like follow this through, this link through. <clears throat> and this opens up a file rcc.c. And you can see that um, this is the, the array definition. And this is the high speed where is the HSI configs? This is actually opening up a different, um, it's not opening up the one I wanted to open up because the libopencm3 library actually supports many different uh, ARM Cortex chips, right? It supports STM32 chips and within the STM32 chips, it supports ARM Cortex-0, ARM Cortex-3, 4, and so on. So when you go into the C files, you often have to just make sure like you're looking at the right, um, you're, you're targeting the right uh, one for you. So in this case, this is the configuration that we are passing. You can see it's just an object that has a bunch of parameters. Uh, these parameters get passed to the PLL itself. Um, and they just kind of configure everything. So um, we could have written this from scratch. Uh, it kind of states the clock frequencies that various things will run at, the buses, the clock speeds of the bus controllers um, and the flash and kind of our voltage scaling and all of that kind of stuff um, is very low level configuration stuff. Um, and we're just gonna take the default here. So uh, that's, that's what that's all about. We don't need to go too much in detail, but now we know that our clock is set up and that our clock frequency is 84 megahertz. So at this point, we're ready to actually set up our GPIO PIM. So I'm just gonna write another function and I'm gonna call it uh, GPIO setup. It's again gonna take no arguments. And again, we should make it static. And at the same time, I'll also include the GPIO header, which will um, <clears throat> Uh, include all the GPO related functions. So if we now do GPO on the score, you'll see that we have a bunch of GPO related things. Um, so we want to do uh, one thing here, which is essentially we want to configure this one pin that we're trying to talk to, right? The pin that the LED is connected to. So we're going to, for that, we're going to call GPO mode setup. And to this, we have to pass a couple of uh, pieces of configuration. We need to pass the port. <clears throat> we need to pass the mode, the pull up, pull down, and the GPIOs. And there is some description of kind of what it means here, but actually the I'll explain each of these elements um, because it's not 
necessarily obvious if you don't know how this kind of works already. So the GPOs are split up into various ports. Um, and a port is just a collection of pins together, right? So you, you may have, uh, I think the STM32s have 16 uh, pins to a port. So if you have something like um, uh, a pin that's called PA5, for example, that refers to port A. So this is the, the A collection of 16 pins. Maybe you have a B and a C and a D. You have port A and then within that port, it's the fifth pin. So PA5 refers to port A pin five. So in this case, we actually do want to um, use the A port, right? The, the, GPI, the GPO that's connected to the LED is in port A. So we're gonna pass this here. Now the next thing is the mode. Um, and again, I'm just gonna use the IntelliSense to kind of work out what I should put here. So if I just put GPO underscore mode, well, here you can see that there are a bunch of constants related to mode. And one of them is output, one of them is mask, one is input, analog, and this AF here refers to alternative function. So we just wanna have an output. So this is the mode that I'm gonna to pass to do this thing. Uh, next, pull up, pull down. Um, pull up and pull down just refer to the fact that in the GPIO peripheral inside the chip, um, each pin can have a pull up or a pull down resistor. And this is a concept that actually, it confused me a lot when I first learned about this in like uh, several years ago about the idea of like pull up and pull down resistors. I kind of thought there was more to it than there actually is. But it's essentially, you can think of it as kind of providing a default value for what this thing should be, like what the value of this thing should be to the outside world if we don't directly drive uh, a high or a low to this pin. So if the pin is in a so-called floating state, like it will still have a recognizable value. And the way that that's done electronically is that a resistor is connected between the pin and either ground or the, the voltage level that represents a high signal. Um, and that resistance is kind of, um, the, the, the way that the, the resistor is set up is that you can easily override it, so to speak, by driving a higher signal through it. So this is kind of, um, this is kind of how that works. I just wanted to sort of cover that because I remember that being a thing I was confused about myself. Again, we'll just use the same strategy. I'll begin to kind of write pull up, GPIO pull up, and we'll see that again, there are a bunch of uh, um, options here. So we can have pull up none, pull down or pull up. So we're just gonna have none, right? Because we're gonna drive the LED on or off, right? We, we're not gonna leave it floating. And finally, we have the pins themselves. GPIO, notice that this is GPIOs. You can actually specify multiple pins at once here. And this is quite, um, it's quite clever how this works. Um, so the pin that the LED is connected to is GPO5 on port A, so it's PA5. So if we search GPO5, and I'm not typing here, GPO5, you'll see that there's just a definition for that. And if we look at that, it's a one shifted up into the fifth position, right? So we don't put the number five here. We take a one and we shift it up in binary five places. Uh, so that actually gives us the number 32. Yep, I think. It gives us the number 32. And if we wanted to include another pin in this, we would actually just uh, use a bitwise or to bring in a different pin. So maybe GPO six. And GPO6, notice, is just one shifted up by six, the sixth position. So you can imagine that you have a 16-bit number, and for any of the, the bits that are in here, they all represent one pin. So if we set this one on and this one on, well, those are the two pins that we're talking about. So that's kind of how that works. And that's used a lot in, uh, in this kind of embedded, uh, embedded world, and we'll see this a fair bit. The idea of actually kind of configuring a port is a, is a really smart one, right? If you want to control a bunch of pins, related pins at once, you can actually set or read all of those values at, in one kind of atomic operation. You don't have to, um, you know, do that over a series of many instructions. You can literally set or read the values of those pins 
in one one go, one instruction. So that's pretty cool. Um, so we've configured the uh, GPIO here and we can just jump down here to the main loop. And before we actually go into the loop, we can run our kind of setup function. So let's just run the RCC setup first. And then we can run the GPIO setup just afterwards. Now you could argue that we probably shouldn't share the same uh, prefix uh, with the um, with the library itself, and I think that's a that's a pretty there's a pretty good reason for not doing that to not get too confused. I'll just leave it like this for now because it's it's kind of clear. Um, now inside this while loop, um, we want to turn the LED on, and then sometime later we want to turn it off and then we want to turn it back on and we kind of want to do that at fixed frequency like I think let's choose for simplicity's sake let's choose that we want this light to be on for one second and we want it to be off for one second well the way that we can do that is just by using the GPIO toggle function which is actually a really handy little function that just means you don't have to keep track of the state right if you only want to flip something from one position to another and you don't care which position you came from you can use toggle. That's quite a common thing that you might not need to care about the, the orientation of this thing, so to speak. So again, this is just going to be GPIO A and GPIO 5 that we pass to this. We pass the port and the pins. Again, pins, we could do this to multiple. Um, in this case, I think it's kind of useful to break out the definition of uh, an LED port and the LED pin. And this just allows us to have, you know, an, a semantic name for this thing instead of using GPO A5. Because if we if we forget somewhere down the line that that is the pin assignment or we want to change the pin assignment, we probably don't want to have to go everywhere that we specified these and change them all at once. So let's actually replace these uh, in line here. And then we can use uh, the LED port and the LED pin. So this code, there, there is currently two problems with this code. The first problem is that, um, and this is a confusing one that I think a lot of people have when they first come to a program an ARM Cortex chip from the ground up, is that by default, um, everything that can be used, every peripheral on the chip that can be used is off by default. So all of the GPIO ports, all of the timers, all of the ADCs, everything you can imagine is off by default. And that's like a power saving thing, right? Inside this chip, you can imagine you want to deploy this with on, on a something that's on a battery or has a very unreliable power supply or is like literally is in like a car and is connected to the car's battery. You don't want it to drain energy for no good reason. So everything is off by default and you need to switch on the things that you're using. So in this case, what we want to do here is just add one more line to the GPIO setup, which is the R calling the RCC. And the way that things are turned off is obviously there's not like a power switch. Um, everything has to receive a clock signal, right? This is why we have, you know, a clock frequency for the central chip and you get various clock frequencies that go out to different parts of the chip and every peripheral receives its own clock. The clock drives, you know, digital electronic signal, uh, digital electronic kind of constructions forward. Um, and so we have to turn on the clock for a particular peripheral. So we're gonna call the peripheral clock enable function, and we are gonna enable a certain peripheral. So the peripheral we are gonna enable is the, I don't know if this is like with all capitals, RCC GPIO, and every port of the GPIO is configured individually as well. So we're going to turn on GPIO A's clock. So now uh, the GPIOs will actually be on. So when we run this toggle function, something will actually happen. But of course, we're not going to see an LED blinking for one second here, right? Because this thing is just going to run as quickly as possible in a while loop uh, forever. So what we will actually see is an LED that appears to be on, but is kind of half as bright as it would normally be. And that is because it's it's kind of in a fixed uh, time frame is on, you know, for half the time and then it goes off and then it goes back on and it's off and it's on. To our eyes, that will average out to a 50% brightness level. Um, so that's what we would see 
it's not very interesting. We want to slow that right down all the ways that it's on for a second and it's off for a second. So for that, we actually need to build um, some kind of function and we'll have something like delay cycles. And delay cycles, we haven't written it yet. We have to write this function ourselves. Um, this function is just gonna take in a number of clock cycles. We're, we're calling it clock cycles, but it's not really clock cycles. Um, we're gonna take in a number of kind of cycles to delay for and we're just going to do nothing for that time. So it's really, um, it's very inefficient in terms of the chip, right? The chip cannot do anything else while we're just counting down, waiting for this time to be over. Um, but for now, this will get us somewhere and we will write a much better timing mechanism uh, in the future. So let's actually write this delay cycles and let's just, you know, imagine we're going to put a number in there somewhere. So um, it's not going to return anything. We'll make it static for now and delay cycles and we are going to take in um, a number of a number of cycles to delay for so we'll make it a uint32 a 32-bit unsigned integer which can carry numbers uh, up until a uh, very large number i don't remember the exact number right now i think four billion um something like that and then we can delay for a certain number of cycles and we want that to be a relatively large number because of course um you know we're running at 84 megahertz, and that is 84 million cycles per second. And so if you wanna wait one second, and this it, this does equate to you know clock cycles, which it doesn't, but let's say it did, you'd have to wait 84 million clock cycles. So you want to be able to receive a large number here. So these are gonna be the number of cycles that we wait for. And we're just gonna have a for loop inside, um, where we start at zero and while it's less than number of cycles, we are going to increment. You might imagine that we could just leave it like this and this would be enough, but the compiler, even in a kind of a debug configuration, is kind of smart enough to see that this is just nothing is happening here and it can just not do this loop, right? There's it can easily see that literally nothing happens but counting this number up and up and up. And so it will eliminate this code. And we don't want it to do that. So let's just put in a piece of inline assembly and run a no op instruction. So this is gonna be enough to tell the compiler like, you know, there's actually something happening in here. Um, a decent a compiler at a certain level of uh, Optimization may also optimize this out and you might have to put a little bit more information to actually make it keep it. But in this case, it will definitely keep this and this should work. Okay, so how many cycles do we delay for? Well, like I mentioned earlier, right, we could delay for 84 million cycles. Um, and that would, uh, that would be if we were running one clock cycle per iteration of this loop, that would be one second. Um, but it's actually not just one instruction, right? Although we are running a no-op instruction and a no-op instruction does take one cycle to execute, we're also incrementing uh, a number here every cycle. And we're also comparing a number to another number every cycle. So because of that, um, there are gonna be at least three or four instructions or at least three or four cycles um, going on for this loop. So what we might do, a good place to start to assume would be that if we divide this by four, this will be roughly the number of clock cycles per second. Um, and we could break this out as well, right? Um, I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna leave it there, but we could break this out into kind of a definition or a constant up above and, and call it like one, se one second. And then we could divide that further down if we wanted to use different, um, a different number of seconds. Uh, but for now, this this should be enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of the lib opencm3 directory and I'm going to go into the app directory and I'm going to run make. And you can see that there were no errors. So that's actually always a good sign. And we've got some artifacts that got built here. So we've got uh, an output file, an object file rather, um, which is basically, you know, just contains all the information of our of our code. We have an elf file, which is uh, kind of the final, like most rich representation of all the information that we have. We can use that file to debug this application. 
we can use that file to extract the actual code that needs to be loaded onto this chip. And that's what this bin file is. We also have a map file. And the map file is a really useful file that tells you where everything in your program ended up um, and how much space it ends up taking and where it comes from. So it can be a really good way of seeing kind of what gets included, like what, what ends up going into your, uh, into your program. Where does it land? Uh, we'll look at this if we need to do some debugging or if we need to kind of figure out like if things are really being included or not, this is kind of a great place to, to figure that stuff out. But for now, I think actually um, this probably worked. It compiled. So let's actually load this onto the board and see if we can get an LED flashing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to power the board on because that's something I have to do in order for the, uh, the J-Link to work correctly. And I'll just lift this up to the camera now. You should be able to see, hopefully in that corner there, that there's a red light on and that just means the board's on and ready. And communication must be uh, established between the two <clears throat> because we were able to turn the board on. Or at least we can talk to the, <laughs> the power, right? Uh, which is a good sign. Okay, so th the easiest way to load code on is just to use the debugger. So I'm, I'm gonna just press play, which will uh, do all the things necessary to load the code on. It's already been loaded. And now we're in this, like, it basically we, it's as if we have a breakpoint here and it just put it put us in the first place inside this function. So I'm just gonna press play. I'm gonna let it, uh, let it continue and we'll see if uh, there is a blinking light. And I can see that there is in fact a blinking light at around one Hertz. Let me just switch the camera to the larger view. And I believe you should be able to see the LED just here blinking roughly once per second or blinking for a second and then being off for a second okay so that's actually a pretty good uh result for that we've got kind of the 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 library working we've got the debugging working we've got the code loading all of that kind of stuff and it appears that our first program was able to do something it's not very interesting but this is the hello world and we have done it in you know just over 30 lines of code. <clears throat> of course, there are many more lines of code backing this, and we are gonna explore kind of what each of these different functions is actually doing. Like what happens when you run GPO toggle? Like what are these various values? Um, we're gonna explore those in the next episode where we will extend this simple example a little bit and kind of set up at least a couple more peripherals and kind of bump bump the level of complexity a little bit. And we'll also in the next few episodes, we're gonna sort of dive into some of the documentation of where you can find information about what this chip can do, like kind of its central documentation location that isn't the library, but is just for this chip. And uh, as we continue down the series, we're gonna get more and more complex and build up a bigger and bigger foundation until we reach, uh, you know, the level of having a whole bootloader application, firmware updates and firmware signing. So I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have any comments, please leave them in the description, in the comments rather. And uh, I'll see you next time.